Christy Coffey is the Director of Business Development for ISAX slash ISAUS and Communities Evangelist for Thread Connect. She has worked in the information technology industry for the last 25 years. Christy holds a degree in computer science and is working toward an MBA with concentration in cybersecurity from the University of Dallas. Without further ado, let's welcome Christy. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. So I'm excited to be here. Um, as Jim mentioned, my official title in the business world is community evangelist, but I actually see myself as a happiness engineer. So I know in the security industry, there's a lot of gloom and doom. We've had some pretty serious and heavy talks today, um, and I'm here to bring you good news. So stay with me and I'll explain. First, um, let me tell you just a little bit about my company. So my company is uh, Threat Connect. Um, Threat Connect, those two words are combined together. We've been in business for about five years. Um, really came largely out of the security industry. Most of our founders worked for three-letter agencies and for the government. Um, and we have a Threat Connect platform, a product called Threat Connect. Um, we started off in the services space with a number of threat intelligence analysts that were working largely at military and government agencies in the U.S. and in Western Europe. And at the time, they were very um, frustrated, is the right word, and with the fact that they were chasing advanced persistent threats, using spreadsheets and SharePoint and email. So our, uh, our CEO, who is a computer scientist, decided he wanted to fix the problem. And we developed um, our product, Threat Connect, which combines aggregating data with analyzing and then acting on it. The other thing we have within our platform is the ability to create communities. So virtual communities, just like we're a community in this room, of, re of researchers and analysts that have various different interests. So the interest could be, um, you know, maybe it's uh, a particular strain of malware or a particular industry sector or a particular geography. So lots of different ways to kind of form communities in the virtual world so that analysts and researchers can work together. So there are a lot of, of benefits to doing this and I'm gonna walk you through some examples. There are only two acronyms, I think, that I'll be using within this presentation. One is an ISAC and the other one is an ISAO. So I-S-A-C, I-S-A-O. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about what those are, but most of what we're gonna talk about is really kind of at a higher level, not a lot of engineering kinds of um, acronyms and things like that during this presentation. So I wrote a paper about three years ago on crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing cyber threat intelligence. And I think this is what we're starting to see. Um, in that paper, I talked about how crowdsourcing is being applied in a variety of different ways outside of the cybersecurity industry. So give, give this some thought. Um, you see flash mobs happening. You see um, uh, things like Amber Alert. That's one of my favorite kind of examples or illustrations of how you, know, you can crowdsource a particular problem. I was looking at uh, Amber Alert's website before I came today because I like to use that as an example of how communities of people working together can help solve a particular problem. Amber Alert, in case you aren't really familiar with kind of the background and history, Amber uh, Hagerman was from right here in DFW and in 1996 she was kidnapped. Unfortunately, she wasn't returned to her family alive. So as Texans, we have something to be very proud of. The whole Amber Alert system that's used across the nation was really established right here in DFW. So uh, a, proud, a proud day for all of us Texans. To date, 758 children have been recovered using the Amber Alert system. That's, that's proud. I mean, those are 758 families who have their child back. But many families don't have their child back. Let me take this one step further. 
I have a daughter who is deaf. And she was a little girl, probably about 10 years ago, and just ornery as anything. We were at the Collin Creek Mall shopping at Christmas time as a family. At the end of the shopping day, my husband decided to take her back home, and I was taking my son to uh, a music lesson in Richardson. He, she didn't understand exactly what was going on, and, and there was some commotion in the parking lot with my husband finally getting her in the car to take her home. Well, someone observed this happening in the, car, in, the, in the parking lot and was trying to yell at my daughter, you know, do you know him? What is going on? Well, she's deaf. She can't hear. She can't, you know, he's across the parking lot. And so we have this kind of, you know, not hostile situation, but from someone who's afar, right, that seems like a very dangerous situation. So my husband got her in the car and away he went. I went off to music lesson and about 15 minutes later, the Plano police, the Richardson police, and the McKinney police stopped my husband. There were like 10 patrol cars. They arrested him for kidnapping, you know, allegedly kidnapping a child. Well, I get a call from the police department telling me that someone had kidnapped my child, and I immediately knew what was wrong. Now, how does this relate to what we're talking about? So going back to the Amber Alert story, right, people find out after the incident has already happened in this particular case, somebody saw something that didn't seem right, notified the authorities. And so if that had been an incident, you know, if that had been an actual perpetrator who had actually taken my daughter, you know, that early warning would have given us better odds of, of, of being able to get her back. So this is what we're talking about in cybersecurity. We're talking about each one of you being a sensor and being able to make a difference when we all put that little bit of information that we know about what's happening in, this, in the cybersecurity space together. That's what we're talking about, early warning crowdsourcing. So let's see. So I want to start talking. <sighs> Clearly I'm not doing this right. There we go. Oh, we went one too far. Oh, too far? Yeah. Which one did you? Uh, okay, got it. Okay, so let's start by talking about... There we go. No, it's not showing here, Jim. Yeah. He was just saying it was a slideshow. I'm oh, sorry, guys. Skip us just me, one uh, sec. You okay, I'll continue talking. So, so the next slide is what is threat intelligence, and this is really kind of important. There's a lot of buzz in the media today about cyber threat intelligence, and you're hearing it a lot. You know, marketing's really caught on to the term, and and there's a lot of conversation about it. But but really, what we're talking about with respect to cyber threat intelligence is knowing your enemy understanding your enemy. So whether that is you as a person, you know, who might be trying to, um, you know, attack your family, attack your home, attack, you know, uh, steal your identity as an example, or whether you're talking about that in the corporate world, you know, is, is some activist or hacktivist or a criminal nation or, or, uh, or nation state after your corporate assets, you know, whatever those might be, you know, in the, in, in, in the corporate world, they're very diverse depending on what your industry is, what your business is, what your market is, and who your customers are. So how, you know, why do you care about that? Because if you know, if you know the operational, tactic, and strategic defense, you can better protect your network assets. So let's think about the operational side of that. What do we mean by operation? Operation means do you know the, uh, the IPs and the malware and the domains that you know, the, the perpetrator is targeting from a, 
from a tactical perspective, do you know what they're using? What is their ammunition? How are they achieving their, um, how are they accomplishing their exploit? You know, are they using a spear phishing campaign? Do they have a watering hole? What is uh, kind of the tactic that they use to get their exploitation? And then the third thing is strategic. You know, what is it that they're after? You know, if you're a bank, they're after financial assets. If you're uh, a biotech company, maybe they're after research. If you're a pharmaceutical company, maybe they're after the next big drug, or maybe your 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 trial and your clinical information. You know, if you're uh, a defense aerospace contractor, then you know perhaps they're after whatever the next uh, you know fighter jet is. So depending on what your what your business is you need to understand what strategically they're after. We, um, you know, I think that in the keynote this morning, um, there was some really good illustrations and actually a little bit scary about how criminal um, organizations are now working together. So this is an example of the opposite side, right? Instead of good, do good doers binding together to work together to solve these kinds of problems, we've got you know, criminals and hacktivists and nation states that are binding together. They're well financed, they're resourced, they have very strategic and um, specific objectives. And they don't, they don't walk away and they don't give up easy. So our best effort is to bind ourselves together and frustrate them. Make sure we're working together to understand what's happening and be able to better protect ourselves. Okay, we'll keep talking. <laughs> so the next slide, it, we'll go back and look at look at some of the slides. The next slide is actually um, an illustration from a Ponymon study that was done and released last year. And in the study, it talks about how um, a single breach. That, first of all, they they surveyed over 250 CSOs, mostly Fortune 500s, but from around the globe. Um, and in that study, it was determined that the cost of a single breach is estimated at $12.7 million. That was as of last year. The year before, a single breach was estimated at $11.9 um, $11.9 million. So that's per breach. That's every single incident. Um, and I, you know, what, what we know as cybersecurity researchers is that those numbers probably are not entirely accurate. So for example, you've got the cost of lost business, you've got infrastructure that can't be used, you've got the breach cleanup. But what you don't understand and maybe can't monetize is the value of whatever assets have been actually stolen. Um, so if we kind of look at Sony as an example, you know Sony was mentioned this morning so um, we look at the Sony breach, it's not just you know the fact that they were unable to use their email for days if not weeks. They had to do a lot of cleanup um, in their infrastructure and in their databases. Um, they probably lost some IP related to movies or releases or whatever. And then they have the whole cost of reputation. So, you know, some of the things that happen in, in terms of a breach are, are not easily monetized. Still no slides. Sorry about that, guys. Um, the thing that the other thing that's really important to understand on this particular Ponymon study is that the most powerful way to gain return on investment is through um, security intelligence, which equates to threat intelligence. Okay, so where does threat intelligence come from? It comes from lots of sources. Um, in some cases, it's your own data. So it's your human sensors, it's your employees that are seeing things that are suspicious. It's your network. It's uh, traffic that may be um, you know, foreign and compromised. Uh, you know, it's things that you're seeing in your IT environment. It's your own knowledge and your own data. That's the number one source, most valuable source of, of intelligence for you. The second most valuable source is 
intelligence that you get from industry partners. So um, this is where we'll talk a little bit about ISACs and ISALs in a moment. It's binding together with others from your respective industries um, and, and understanding what they might be seeing because we know that sophisticated adversaries tend to target the same industry in similar ways. Um, so by working together, you have a better shot at, um, at understanding and being able to put protective mechanisms in place. Another thing that is quite useful often, depending on how much you have to spend, is uh, you can purchase data. So you can purchase threat intelligence feeds from a variety of, of vendors. Some of the, the vendors that you'll hear right, quite often are iSight Partners and CrowdStrike. Um, there are others as well, so you can get data that way. You can get data from open sources. So there are a number of researchers and consultants and, and bloggers that are putting out into cyber the things that they're seeing, the research they're doing, um, you know, the badness that's happening, and they're sharing that with kind of the community as a whole. We, my company has, um, in addition to having a threat intelligence product, we have a, a threat intelligence research team. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that they do. But one thing that's important to know is that they're constantly out hunting on behalf of our customers. So they look across a variety of industries and they're hunting to find badness. And when they find badness, they share it with our communities. So, um, you know, that's one of the advantages of, of kind of being in our platform and being in our communities is that you have someone who's got your back. You have somebody who's out there looking maybe in places that you don't have time, you don't have resource, maybe you don't even have the skills to be able to do that. So it's like having a, you know, a team of sharpshooters that are constantly out watching for you. So intelligence comes in lots of flavors, or the data comes in lots of flavors. So for example, um, things that you need to be concerned about is trust. So you know, going back to kind of the kinetic world, if my husband comes home and tells me, well, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've been told that um, there are a number of stolen cars being, happening in you know, our area, McKinney. And so, you know, I, I tend to trust him because I know him very well and I know he's a credible resource. In my neighborhood, you know, if somebody in my neighborhood said, hey, you know what, we've heard there's a lot of theft of vehicles happening in, in kind of this general area, still I trust them, but maybe not as tightly as I trust my husband. If you expand a little bit further and you kind of look at the community or maybe you look at the nation or you look at your state, you know, how what's that trust level? The kind of the further you get away from the vetted, careful, uh, trusted relationships, maybe the less um, the less uh, trust you have in the information. You have to pay a little bit more attention. But is there less value in having that? I kind of question that there there is not. You know, I, I think that having that information, knowing that early warning, you know, maybe you need to do some analysis. Maybe you need to do some further research. Maybe you need to do some refinement. You know, is the information timely? But 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 having that information is again power, and it gives me the ability to do something proactively about it. There's a whole cycle um, uh, associated with taking disparate pieces of data processing them, analyzing them, and then making them useful. So at the end of the day, what you want to do as, a, as a, a threat intelligence researcher or an analyst is you want to process all this data and you want to make it actionable. You want to be able to get it out into whatever your network defense products are so that you know, your, your enterprise is, 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 is protected. I work with a lot of analysts and a lot of researchers, and one of the things that they tend to be nervous about when they're sharing um, cyber threat intelligence information or data with communities is, well, what if my data is not good enough? You know, what if I, I don't really um, haven't done all the analysis? You know, is it is the trade-off for you know letting somebody know early better than letting them know something later? And I think we've got some really good case studies and examples that that explain um, that the early warning is actually better. So, yes, that's my presentation.
Okay, I'll keep going. We can go back over the slides. Um, so ISAC and ISAO. So again, the only two acronyms I'm going to challenge you with. And ISAC is an information sharing and analysis center. There is actually a national council of ISACs, um, and I think 17 different flavors of ISAC. So for example, there's a, a financial services community, or I'm sorry, a, a financial services ISAC. You know, John South mentions, was mentioned um, in the keynote this morning that he's kind of one of the founders of the FS ISAC. And what that does is it brings together banks, financial institutions, and insurance agencies who may be seeing um, seeing threats. Um, some of the other ISACs that exist are, uh, there's an aviation ISAC, um, an oil and natural gas ISAC, thank you. Okay. Um, a retail ISAC, a water ISAC, so lots of ways that you can slice industries and those ISACs bring together businesses and um, public sector um, organizations that, um, that need to work together uh, to look at the threat landscape. So let's maybe go back just a slide or two. Yeah, so, okay, so here we go. Know your en enemy. So this was the first thing we talked about. What is uh, threat intelligence? It's really understanding your enemy. Why do you care? Because knowledge is power. So again, it's the three things, right? Operational, tactic, strategic. What, what do they use? How are they doing it? And what are they after? understanding those three things. So here's the Ponymon study. And again, we talked about how much is uh, a breach. This is as of last year, $12.7 million per breach. And then at the top, it shows that the security intelligence um, is the number one ROI way for um, improving your uh, security posture. So we talked about this, where does it come from? So again, lots of places, internal sensors and research, government feeds and reports, um, vendor, vendors provide threat intelligence or data sources that you can actually purchase. There's a lot of open source data that's available. We provide data. Um, and one thing I didn't mention was emails and trust groups. So there are a lot of what they call fight clubs, where it's an email listserv, a private listserv, and you know these fight clubs kind of spin up around different kinds of things. So I think malware is something that I hear about quite often, where you have a fight club that's kind of spun up around a particular strain of malware, and all these researchers are, are talking about it and sharing what they know. Um, and then researcher blogs. And again, we talked about lots of flavors, so complete list, completeness, timeliness, structure, context, um, the types of threats, and the variety of indicators. And then you have a, kind of a life cycle here around taking the disparate pieces of, um, of data and really creating something that is quite actionable so that you can really protect your organization. So ISACs and ISAOs, um, as I mentioned, there's a council of national ISACs. There are, I think, 17 ISACs. I named a, a, a number of them. Um, some of, some of the ISACs that I think have interesting, they, they all have membership requirements, and most of the time, I think if not all of the time, they're not-for-profit organizations. So in, in most cases, if not all cases, there's some cost to joining an ISAC. Now, I do know that at least, uh, I know of one example where um, this particular ISAC doesn't have a, a membership cost. So there's two levels of subscription, and um, it's the aviation ISAC. So um, in that particular ISAC, they have kind of a, a, a tiered membership, but they um, feel like we do, that it's very important to to arm the aviation industry or the aviation community um, with, with what they're seeing. And so as a not-for-profit, I know that they do offer no cost memberships. Now, I, you know, from an ISAC perspective, I, I think about this sometimes, how, um, how glad I am that, that those organizations exist. I mean, think about it. Aren't you, doesn't it help you find a little bit of comfort to know that the aviation industry, the airlines, and, and others that are working in the aviation industry are actually working together? They're talking and collaborating about the cybersecurity and other threats that they're seeing. I mean, I, I find that as a, you know, frequent flyer to be very comforting. And likewise, you know, the financial services industry as well. You know, banks, we want them to work together. We want them to protect our assets. So it's important to have these ISACs there to be able to um, 
facilitate that collaboration. And I know that the ISACs also get, you know, they get data feeds from the government and from other places as well. Um, so they, they have a lot of knowledge, not just member shared knowledge, but they get data from other places as well. Now, the ISOWs are kind of new. So in uh, February of this year, President Obama um, released Executive Order 13691 and established the formation of the ISAO. So what is an ISAO? How is it different than an ISAC? So the ISACs have a very specific mission. The ISAOs are intended to be a more flexible instrument for binding together um, binding together organizations in maybe not just a, a specific industry kind of way, but maybe other ways, you know, maybe geography or around particular threats or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, those, those are in many cases a combination of, of um, private and public sector collaboration. Um, there is, I think, some very exciting things that are happening around the ISAO world. Um, ISAOs are forming today. Um, there are some standards and guidelines that are being developed for certification of ISAOs. So, you know, bringing together a community of organizations, creating an ISAO, and then um, getting that certification um, according to the, the standards that are being developed. The reason why this is going to be important is there's additional legislation that's being proposed that will incent companies to share. So, for example, um, I saw some legislation, I don't think it's been passed, but um, what it is, what it intends to do is to provide a financial tax credit to companies who are sharing cyber threat intelligence information. There also is some discussion happening right now in industry around cyber insurance and being able to offer um, discounts for organizations that are participating actively in ISACs and ISAOs. Now, I mean, you know, this is uh, this is far from being realized, but I think the the um, the idea is there. It's been seeded. Um, work efforts are being done both in the cybersecurity industry, in legislation, and with the um, development of the ISAO standards and certifications. So, I think we're going to see some good things coming out of there. So I want to take you into more, some use cases now a little bit. I go backwards, yeah, okay. So, so sharing use cases. So as I mentioned, we host a number of different communities within our platform. We have thousands of users. So think about that, thousands of human sensors. And then we create kind of a match.com environment for them where, you know, users who um, have Threat Connect accounts and we offer free accounts in our public cloud environment, so anyone can sign up for an account and participate in whatever communities are relevant to them. Um, we, we see lots of kinds of things that are happening in the communities that we can participate in. So um, at the grandest level, we have what we call open source communities. So we have um, open source communities where all of the researchers and the, and the, and the individuals who participate in this community are non-attributed but they're sharing open source data. So things that they're blogging about, things that they're seeing, um, things that are, um, you know, are, they're, you know, getting kind of some training from their participation in this community. So in the analyst training space, I see things happening in this open source community where someone will say, I have an IP. How do I know if this is bad? And you'll see someone from the community actually respond and say, well, this IP originates here, and we can, I, you know, we can um, tie this IP to this particular entity. And this type of entity is usually known for doing this and that and the other thing. And so you see conversations kind of happening in, in these open source communities. So it's not just sharing badness, but it's also a way to kind of skill and, and ask questions. Um, we also have in... Uh, in other communities, some things like, uh, I think I mentioned our, our public communities where we have industry, they're focused on industries. So for example, we have an oil and natural gas community. I don't know if anyone here works in the oil and natural gas industry. We have um, a global financial services community. We have a manufacturing community. 
we have a U.S. defense contractor and aerospace community. We have a retail community. So we've kind of crossed, we have energy. So we cross all of these different kind of sectors and we bring together um, organizations that are interested in working together around threats that they might be seeing. I can tell you that since I've been here today, I've seen a post in our oil and natural gas community where a large petroleum industry has actually pa uh, posted some information about a watering hole. And I can tell you that um, we had a post this morning in um, our um, defense contractor and aerospace community from a very large um, defense contractor. So, you know, the communities actually work and people are sharing the things that they're seeing. We also have a number of private communities that I don't have access to, we don't have access to at all. But I do have some case studies that have been shared with me out of those communities, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Um, another use case for communities is supply chain partners. So um, I know there's a lot of discussion these days, especially after the target breach, about supply chain and the vulnerabilities associated with supply chain. So imagine creating a community where everyone who's within a, a particular sub supply chain is actually working and talking and responsible and accountable for reporting the things that they're seeing because it does have potential impact to the entire supply chain. We know that adversaries tend to target the weakest link, so it's important to have that information shared. We're also working with InfraGuard um, organizations where maybe there's some public and private sector collaboration and sharing, you know, for a particular geography, as an example, a state InfraGuard or maybe a, you know, a, a city or a, a, a local InfraGuard chapter where, you know, these folks are highly trusted, highly vetted, and they want to form a private community to be able to collaborate and work around the different things that they're seeing. Um, we have some kind of broader examples as well where we um, are working with, um, there will be an announcement made on Tuesday, I think, uh, about SANS. So we're working with the SANS Institute. I don't know if any of you have ever attended SANS training, but they have some new cyber threat intelligence um, courseware that they are rolling out, and we're creating a, um, a community for their alumni. So this will be an, an opportunity for SANS alumni to kind of continue to work together and, and continue their research and conversation from, you know, taking it into the classroom, into the workplace, and being able to maintain those relationships in a virtual way and working together. Some of the, um, going back to the kind of the next side over, you know, Along the bottom, we have organizational maturity and community trust. We've talked about trust, but we really haven't talked much about maturity. Organizations have different levels of skills and they have different levels of maturity. You know, Fortune 10 company has probably a very different profile than a company that, you know, maybe has one IT guy that's responsible for patch management and, and looking at logs. So you, very different resource, but still there's a lot of... Um, a lot of good things that can happen from having a variety of different sizes of organizations and skills within the community. What we see a lot in the public communities that we run are uh, a lot of consumption. So pretty much everybody wants to be a consumer. You know, they want to consume known bads. So if someone's putting something out there and says, this is bad, you know, protect yourself, they're happy to consume it. Um, going up kind of the maturity model, we have to see enrichment. So what I mean by enrichment is that you know organization has shared, you know, this APT group, uh, we're seeing, you know, some some um, some spear phishing emails that are coming from a particular APT group. We've been able to attribute it to a particular APT group. You know, be aware of this. Maybe someone else is seeing the same thing, but in a slightly different flavor. So then they'll go in and they'll enrich that data. So what you see is you see everybody, you know, putting in their piece of the puzzle. And as they put that piece of the puzzle in, the picture of what that threat looks like and how they're um, how they're operating becomes much more clear. And you have a broader sense of, of what that looks like and you can do a better job of protecting yourself. The most mature organizations tend to be the ones that are contributing. So they're contributing what they see, they've got buy-in from their management or from their their CISO, that you know they do want to be leaders in the community, they want to share what they're seeing, and they want to, uh, to empower the community and to do the same. So what I tend to see in the communities that I have access to, which are only our public communities, as I mentioned before, is kind of a, 
you know, a progression. So you'll see analysts kind of doing some learning in communities and, and doing consumption. And then, you know, maybe they'll find something that they can contribute back in. They'll do some enrichment. And then as the organization matures and they become leaders, um, they'll start doing more, more contribution. The highest level of maturity is really machine to machine. So this is you have a trusted, um, a dr trusted data source and you want to um, use an automated programmatic interface, an API, to push that data out into whatever your sensors or your network defense products are. So that's a, a very, very mature kind of um, relationship. You have to trust the source um, in order to, to take direct action on it. Oh, and one thing I wanted to mention is that on the machine to machine, there are some standards that make that uh, possible. So I know a lot of vendor products like ours, for example, have uh, an API um, that allows that or enables that machine to machine. But you'll hear quite often in the industry um, organizations that have developed a standard like Sticks and Taxi is mentioned quite often. I know a lot of the ISACs are using Sticks and Taxi to push data out um, programmatically to their, to their members. The other thing I should mention, too, before we leave this slide is that um, there are generally in all of the communities that we run, and I'm sure also as well in the ISACs and ISALs that operate, rules for how to, that, that govern behavior, good behavior. So for example, in the sharing world, rules would be things around, for example, what the traffic light protocol is for the data that can be shared. So maybe a particular community, you can only share TLP wide or TLP TLP green indicators, but not amber or red. So if you look at the US CERT traffic light protocol, there's kind of a, a classification for data that, that um, is used quite often. And um, you know the rules will, will define what kinds of data can be, can be used. Other rules in the community will involve things like um, how you can use the data. So for example, if you participate in a community, you can use that data for your own net defense, but you can't necessarily share it beyond the community. Um, another rule for the community would be, you know, that you're vetted and you are a member of this particular industry sector. So again, it's about building a community with trust, recognizing that there are different levels of trust, and being able to build communities that um, respect that trust. Um, some of the communities that we offer are attributed, meaning that the members all know each other. They can see the person's identity. They can see the corporate identity. And then others that we have, like our open source communities, everyone's attributed. I, I mean, non-attributed. They're, uh, they're known by a pseudonym. So I wanted to talk about two success stories. So these are, I think, Going back to my happiness engineer, this is what it's all about. This is the, the goodness that comes from working with others that, um, you know, that believe in this, this mission of working together. So on the left side, let's just focus on the left side first. This is a case study that was brought to me because this, was a pri this is a private community that I don't, we don't have access to at all. But it's a private community that is operated by a um, U.S. military agency. They formed the community with their mission partners. So they have a cyber mission, and um, they formed the community with their mission partners. This is a, a case study that came very, very early. They now have probably a couple dozen mission partners in this particular community. But at the beginning, they had five. Five. That's all they had. Five people. Five people around a table working for different military agencies, but all having something common in common. Um, you know, basically talking across the table about what they're seeing in the in the cyber threat world, okay? But virtually within our platform. So of the five, the first organization who actually is the uh, the director of the community and, and kind of spun it off um, contributes 50 indicators. So these are like IPs and domains, things of that nature. Shares it with the community of five. The um, in step number two, organization three says, oh, well, guess what? We've seen it too, and this uh, we've seen a spearfish that looks like it's related to the same, um, the same threat that you're, you're talking about. So they then share into the community the spearfish that they're seeing, okay? Organi organization five says, oh, gosh, we have it. 
we found an infection. The, we didn't see the 50 IPs, but the spearfish that came from organization number three, we actually have an active infection. So right there, there's value in the community. Somebody found something that they might not have found otherwise, or certainly they found it earlier than if they hadn't been alerted by the community. And then interesting enough, in step four, organization five finds a similar malware that's related to all of this activity that's happening today in their malware repository from two years earlier. So again, this is the threat group that's obviously been doing some badness for some period of time. But these five organizations, military organizations, that have the same or similar um, uh, mission are sitting around a virtual table talking about what they're seeing, sharing what they know, and the picture becomes much more clear. So, you know, again, it took some leadership to, it took everybody looking and honestly reporting what they're seeing, but now they have a much more complete picture of this particular adversary. And, you know, and not only that, but one of the real benefits that came out of this particular case study is analyst learning, which is right here. And what do I mean by analyst learning is that not only did they share the IPs, not only did they share the active infection, not only did they share the malware, they shared how they discovered it. So they talked about what they did that helped them find this badness. And that's part of, you know, as an analyst, as a researcher, that learning is what makes you better skilled. So it's not just having the data, it's really understanding that. The second case study I have, I love this one too. This actually um, came out of one of our industry communities. This particular company is huge. They are huge and they are global and they um, had a, a Chinese actor, APT, that was targeting them for two years. And the story that was told to me is that we played whack-a-mole. Every time that adversary wanted to come into our networks, they walked through the door. Well, because they were participating in our industry community, they got a tip from someone in the community that, hey, guess what? We saw this, and it's this APT group. You know, beware. Early warning through our, you know, through features in our product, they were notified immediately, and for the first time in two years, they were actually able to put blocks in place. So, you know, again, community awareness, um, understanding what's happening, faster threat awareness, turning, going from kind of a reactive defense to a, a predictive defense, a, a proactive defense is what we're talking about. Um, advice from NIST, so, you know, a lot of times researchers are kind of like, we need to see something more concrete. You know, my management needs to understand. There's a really nice guidebook that came out um, last year. So I think it's in draft yet. I don't believe it's been approved, but it's NIST 800-150, Guide to Cyber Threat Information Sharing. Um, you know, the tagline on this particular document is cybersecurity. Your mother was right. Sharing is good, and NIST has some help on how. So, I mean, they're, they're speaking my language. Um, you know, two things that kind of resonated with me as I went through the guidebook. And the guidebook is really easy to read. It's very easy to understand. I think it gives you some very tangible kinds of things that you can do as an organization. You know, you need to move from an informal, reactive, or ad, ad hoc kind of um, threat intelligence uh, kind of um, space to a, a more reactive cybersecurity approaches, which is what we're talking about, working with others. Um, you need to establish information sharing roles. We talked about that. Joining a sharing community are important first steps. So, you know, get your toe in the water, join a community, um, see what's out there, follow, follow folks on Twitter, you know. There are all kinds of uh, open source blogs and researches, researchers that are doing a lot of good work. And, you know, those are freely available to you. Now, our product is free. You can sign up for a community account and join our industry communities. You just need to be vetted to be able to do so. Um, one thing I wanted to mention to you, and I'm going to kind of wrap up a little bit on this slide, is that last week our intelligence research team um, posted a, I mean, last week or the week before, maybe two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I think, um, we released a, a, a report called Operation Camera Shy. This is Operation Camera Shy. It's like 80 pages. Um, it was picked up and uh, the story was run on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. You can download Operation Camera Shy from our website, um, threatconnect.com. 
um, it's important because it's the first, as far as I'm aware, and I think as far as my company's aware, the first time that a research team has been able to definitively attribute some badness to uh, a nation state actor. And this is around the South China Sea. So it has implication not just to um, you know, the South China Sea area where it's very energy rich and, uh, and resource um, rich, but also to, um, to a number of different organizations as well as um, the energy sector as, as well. The report goes through kind of a, a lot of analysis. There are a lot of charts and graphs in there um, where you can really study and see how our analysts what, they, what the methodology was that they used to kind of derive the, um, the conclusions that they had. Some of the things that I think are quite important to note is that um, I think this, this APT group was running for maybe five years. There was a lot of information. It was uh, Nikon, APT, it was an existing threat group. Our researchers took a lot of work that had already been done by Semantic and others, dug deeper tied things together using um, the methodology that, um, that we use, which is the diamond model for intrusion analysis, and were able to come up with some very specific conclusions. As they went through the data, um, some things that were quite interesting. One thing was that 50, 50, 5, 0 percent of the IPs that were identified with this particular threat actor only um, resolved one time, one time. And of those IPs, 60% were only used for one day or less, one day or less. So they were burning IPs, and they weren't staying out there for very long. So if you're using traditional defenses against a nation state actor and trying to block IPs, that may not be your most effective uh, security plan. So I would encourage you to maybe take a look at the report. There's a lot of really good analysis there. Um, you can look at the charts and the graphs. You can see how our team went about it. And they really walk you through it step by step. So again, Operation Camera Shy is out on our website. Uh, I think we've talked about all these you know, things. Get started. Open source data, it's there. Free communities, we have them. Um, there are a lot of threat intelligence platforms emerging on the market. Um, you know, I'm particularly fond of ours. I think we have uh, the best platform and the best team. But, you know, find something that works for you and your organization. But it's really important that you start, you know, joining the community and participating. You know, it's, it's bad out there. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the, um, the bad guys are well-resourced. They are very determined. And the only chance that we really have at, um, at really mitigating the, the threat is to work together. And I think as a research community, that's what we need to do. So in closing, there's uh, a quote from Edmund Burke that I'm particularly fond of. I don't have it on the screen, but I should have. Um, he said, all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And I think that's um, where I'd like to leave you. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes, we do. We have a European community of interest that binds together banks, uh, retail, medical and health, um, uh, aviation, government, military, just a variety. I think we'll probably have one up for um, the Middle East, and then also possibly in Asia in uh, 2016. So, other questions? No, you don't. You can uh, for our for our particular platform. You can have we have kind of two flavors of accounts. So you can sign up as a, a researcher with your Gmail or your Outlook or your Yahoo account. Um, there's no cost to do that. You can participate in our open source communities. For our industry communities that we offer, or um, we, uh, you have to have an organization. So you have to use your corporate email if you want to, you know, if you're from a bank and you want to be in the banking industry community, you have to, you actually have to sign up for an, an organization account. But certainly um, as a researcher, that's a great way to get in and get started. There's a lot of data in the platform and that's, you know, available for you to use. Any other questions?
Did anybody, while I was here, download the report, the Operation Camera Shy report? One person did? I have a t-shirt for you. <laughs> and they're really cool, too. Um, we had um, some leftover t-shirts after Black Hat, and everyone in our office is Star Wars crazy. So this is a Star Wars-themed uh, threat intelligence t-shirt. Um, does anyone here have a Threat Connect account today? Hey, I'll give you a t-shirt as well. Thank you for being here. All right, everybody, it's a cruel world. Let's go take care of it.